Hello, sportsmen. Hey, look at the wintertime. Look at all the local lakes that a lot of people have right around them. There's people ice fishing. Ice fishing can be a lot of fun. I'll tell you what, we're going to go ice fishing. We're going to catch some bluegill. I'm going to show you some techniques, how to build an ice sled. we got a lot of things to do. You stay tuned. I'm Fred Trost. You're watching The Practical Sportsman. Well, right out between us and that shanty, there's, there's some 40-foot water. Then it bumps up on a two-foot ledge runs for about 25 yards and then drops down to a 12 foot mud flat and that's where we're hitting them Ooh. big ones hitting them on the mud flat yeah right over the mud flat i think they eat you know wigglers and marvy and everything else mm. all winter and this is bluegill yes big bluegill big bluegill a guy oh heck i'm gonna jinx myself <laughs> I know it, but a guy brought a four-inch auger last week out here, and some of the gills were getting stuck in his hole coming up. Well, truly. Seriously. Sorry. <laughs> Lee Thomas is our guide. He's the gunsmith at Mill Creek Sports and Dexter, but he didn't say this would be as easy as shooting fish in a barrel. He just said the fishing would be very good. Our fishing party was a virtual parade of ice fishing sleds. The one I was using was a store-bought sled. Window up front for light from a lantern, well designed for pan fishing. But behind me was Carlos Federoff, a well-known name in the world of Michigan fishing. Carlos was pulling a homemade sled, one made from scrap lumber. It didn't have any fancy attachments, but this sled had special meaning for Carlos because his son made it for him. Behind Carlos was Charlie Keenan, pulling a sled that his father made when Charlie was 17 years old. For a 30-year-old sled, it's held up very well, and Charlie really enjoys using it because it, too, has special meaning. And behind Charlie was Matt Radzilowski pulling a deluxe homemade sled. Gary Botek from Charlotte designed and built this one. Excellent craftsmanship, and it has many features that make it extremely practical for an ice fisherman. Now, Lee Thomas brought the bait buckets on top of a portable shanty that he'd put up if it got windy. These are my last, there should be four in a row here. Oh, for your shanty. Yeah, this is, this is where I've, the last two times I've come, I got 31 the first time with another friend of mine. 31 what? Big gills. What's big? Mm, eight and a half, the smallest one we caught, and the biggest was 10 inches. Most of them were about nine, nine and a half. And uh, these are the holes? Yep, these are the holes. And then I came three nights ago, and by myself, I got 18 in an hour. Whoa. And it's right at dark? Yeah, usually about an hour before dark. Great. Great. Where, where, where can I spud my hole? Well, anywhere within about a 30 foot radius. 30 foot? Okay. Anywhere in here. Right okay. here. Well, I got started using the old-time spud, which I found is kind of fun when the ice isn't too thick. The hand-me-down Swedish ice auger that's gone with Charlie Keenan's ice sled had lost its edge. So he borrowed Matt's hand-powered ice drill with a sharp blade. And these hand augers work pretty well until the end of the season. And that's when the ice gets two feet thick. Then the power auger is the practical tool for the job. But there's a fringe benefit to the hand auger or a spud. It's good exercise for the upper body. Yep, yeah, I call this, you know, if we're doing an infomercial, this would be the spud glide. Send in for the spud glide, seven easy payments of $49.95. Order your spud glide today. Lose weight, feel fit. If you act now, we'll include at no extra charge the skimmer trimmer to exercise your wrists. Okay, I'm threading, threading this four-pound test onto this rod. Now, this fishing rod, if you can take a look at these guides here, uh, this is a homemade fishing rod. This is one that a guy named Al Chase, well, Al Chase was on the show with Kerry. They had a couple of recipes a few years ago, and Al knew that I was an ice fisherman, and he saw some of the equipment that I used that he thought was a little tacky. And he says, you need this homemade rod uh, to use for bluegill. So he gave it to me. Well, the handle and the, and, the, and the blank was separate. Huh. And I had to put the cork on and drill it and put the rod in. 
Well, the cork just to make it a little bit longer. Yep, and, it, and the cork could keep your hands warm, I think. Uh, but this, is a, this is a long and limber, limber yep. ice fishing rod. That's yeah. how you like it? I like them, uh, the long rods for deep water because the farther I hold it over the head, my head, mm -hmm. I have the angle of my line coming out of the hole upwards instead of trying to pull them up the ridge of the ice. Yeah, this is a great rod with a cork handle here. Nice and warm when you have your, your gloves off. And now I gotta rig this baby up. So what I'm gonna put on here is a little teardrop. Ice fishing gear is quite small. You can see the size of this teardrop. I mean, that's a, a teeny little teardrop and I'll put a wax worm on there. This is the bobber I'm gonna use. It's a fill float and tie it in with this line. This is probably about four pound test line. But this bobber, if you don't know how they work, work a little differently from other bobbers. These are rubber, little rubber round ends that go around the end of the bobber. And what you have to do is thread the line through there to get these babies on your line. And then you tie the bobber into it wherever you want. I'll show you how that works in a minute. Next thing I do is I tie the, there we go. Well, you can't do very fancy knots with these small ones, but just tie a clinch knot. And there's the teardrop with the two little rubber tubes threaded through the line. And what I'm going to do, show you, this is how you set it up. You put the, you want the bright end of the bobber on the top. So I'll just put it right through there and the other end of the bobber but like yay and pull that tight and this way you can move the line pull it like that I'm actually pulling the line through there and setting the bobber where I want it but that'll make a nice little little float for bluegill okay I got my my wax worm on the teardrop skimming off the remainder of the ice on the hole because I'm going to feed this down through now remember I have this bobber on the line and initially it's a short distance from the teardrop, but I take it and I just feed it through my fingers as it slides through those little rubber tubes. It's kind of a slick idea. Now I have the line preset because I checked the depth and I let out enough line to just reach the bottom. So what I'm gonna do when I first start here is let the teardrop down almost to the bottom. Now this here should be at the bottom but I'm about maybe eight or 10 inches above the bottom. A little ice on the top there. But look how this float floats. See it, it's mostly underwater. See that? Only the very tip is out of the water. That means it's gonna be very sensitive to any motions. I mean, if I just touch the line like that, just touch it very lightly, look at that thing wiggle. That means if a bluegill sucks it in, moves it, touches it down there, I'm gonna see it. Here we Crank go. It up, gentlemen. There, see it? There see, see that? See it moving, John? What? See that barber go? I will be vindicated. That was yeah. a big one, too. It's still here. I've got it on. All right. Oh! How about that? Not bad. How about that? Not How about that? What do you mean, not giant? I, I, well, I had just, to hook it for just you. Just cut out this non giant stuff. <laughs> this, this will set the standard for giant until we catch something bigger. Oh, ooh, ooh, ooh. Got a nice one? Oh, don't you love that? <laughs> the rod tip bouncing. Now this was right near the bottom. I set this down a little deeper. Oh, yes. Look, that's bigger. Line just broke. My line just broke, Lee. Uh -huh. That's how big it was. Oh, that's a dandy. Yeah, because it was a sunshiny afternoon, the bluegills didn't hit until just before dark. Well, we picked up enough for several good meals. We didn't get any of the huge bluegills, but hey, we had to save something for next week. That is a dandy gill. Agreed? Agreed. Okay, good.